Good evening and welcome to another edition of Truckee Talks. I'm Ted Owens sitting in for Maya Schneider this evening. Uh, today we have with us Mark McLaughlin who is a weather historian. He's also a return guest. I believe you were here with Maya last year. Just in time for the storm like today. Perfect. Yeah, perfect thanks, timing. Ted. Uh, Mark lives in Carnelian Bay. Uh, he's written several books on uh, weather and other assorted stories. Uh, Tales of Lake Tahoe, I think you've done two editions of that book here, yes. Sierra Stories. And volume your, one. Uh, volume one and volume two. He's also a uh, feature writer for uh, numerous uh, local publications, uh, such as the Well, the Truckee Sierra Sun and uh, <coughs> also that the Tahoe Truckee This Week magazine, free magazine out of North Shore. I see, and you uh, lecture on numerous subjects, the most recent being the history of the Stevens, Townsend, Murphy Party of 1844. They passed through this area before the Donner Party, I understand. Successfully. Successfully, yes. yes. And he's a recipient of the Bill Berry Award, which I'll ask some questions about in a few moments, as well as uh, numerous other journalism awards. And uh, welcome. Good to have you here. Ted, it's always a pleasure. Thank yes. you. We met three, three or four years ago one evening and talked weather. I had never met a weather historian. Well, there's not too many of us. No, no I don't think so. Now, last year, <clears throat> at about this time exactly, you made a prediction for the, uh, the weather we should expect uh, for the Well, winter. I just passed along the word of what the prediction was. Yes. Okay. Well, I just, for fun, grins and giggles, thought we'd uh, roll that tape and uh, oh, see great. how well you did. <laughs> so why don't we'll we take see. a look? Well, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just an observer. Oh, for the United States this year, and I can do this a little bit easier, we're going to be, if you can see that, wetter than normal here, cold, snowy, and stormy in the north central part of the United States, also up here in New England, and then this will tend to be dry and mild. And once again, we're in this limbo land where it's really hard to say, hard to say. with a, a, a computer model or numerical models, just, just kind of points to a, a normal year, even though those normal years have gone from the wettest to the driest, and it just averages that way to be normal. Mm -hmm. It tends to give us extreme weather. So it's a push. Well, we'll see how this year pans out. It'll be interesting to see if the uh, forecasts or predictions are as accurate this mm -hmm. year as they were last year. But it's the... It, now that wasn't bad. It worked out pretty well. It did. So, uh, uh, As far as I could tell there, I think I had New England down as being kind of stormy, and I don't think New England was very good last year. That's why we, everybody was skiing here from the Rockies and the East Coast. We're all out here because we got a 150% of normal. Well, are you uh, <clears throat> willing to uh, take a go shot? Out and go out on a limb. My record of 1-0. And, and, and make a um, prediction for this year? Well, actually, the forecast is for a, an identical pattern in the sense that it will be wet in the Pacific Northwest. It will tend to be. Last year, Mount Baker picked up 95 feet of snow. It's a new all-time seasonal snowfall record. And Mount Baker is located uh, where? And the Northern Cascades near the yeah. Canadian-Washington state border. And uh, Southern California came in with about 50% average precipitation, so they were drier than normal. And the La Nina-influenced winters, which are, once again, they can last from one, two, three years. We are now in the second year. The forecast is for the La Nina to continue and to maintain itself through early part of uh, the year 2000 for our winter. So it should affect our weather pattern, and uh, it tends to enhance the areas that are wet, like the Pacific Northwest, and it will tend to enhance the dry patterns that you will tend to find in the southern part of our state. And we are really being on that cusp, but I'll tell you, I thought last year was wonderful. A lot of real dry snow, a lot of great powder storms for boarders and skiers. It was just great. And uh, if you can chalk us up for another one this year, I'll sign up. I'd like to see it. Well, not too good. We've had five <laughs> wet winters in a row. I mean, every, now every time you roll the dice, it's a 50-50 chance of an average winter. Statistically, you've always got a 50-50 chance. But with a La Nina pattern, it tends to give you a little bit better chance to be a little wetter than normal. And an El Nino will do the same thing. So they are signature patterns that do help us tend to. Now, Mark, there's a dividing line between the north and the south where it's going to be drier than normal, where it's going to be wetter than normal. And I understand that moves right. some, We're almost dead center in that line. Do you have we any are, feeling for where that's going to be this year? <laughs> Feeling? 
I feel that it's going to, my personal intuitive feeling is that it will be significantly drier than last year. In uh, our particular In our area. particular area. I think we will be extremely fortunate to get that much snow again uh, and to have such a big year like we did last year. Uh, but the pattern should be colder than normal and a good chance for being a little bit wetter than normal. And as you mentioned, that gray zone, that zone about where it really happens, is just to our north. So at least we're close to it. Okay, and now what about temperature? Uh, temperature should be colder than normal. Uh, statistically, a La Nina event brings us colder than normal weather. Now, uh, maybe, uh, you know, what I'd like to do, actually, before we go much further, we talked okay. a little bit before we were on the air here, uh, about how many weather historians there actually are. I think it might be <laughs> of interest uh, to the folks at home. Well, there aren't that many because um, it's really... It's kind of a job that I made up for myself. I had met a man I mentioned to you before, uh, Dr. David Ludlam, and he was actually a uh, history professor at Princeton. But he had been involved in forecasting the invasion of Italy in World War II, mm -hmm. weather-wise. And this was really what put weathermen on the map. Before that, we had the Signal Service, we had the Weather Bureau, but this is when things really started to change. You took it as it he came. He got real then. excited. And uh, he became a weather historian. He wrote the Weather History of Vermont, and he's all these other books, New Jersey, Nantucket Island. And uh, I met him. He lives close to where my parents live in Pennsylvania. And I met him. And then when he retired, he uh, gave me his information and everything that he had saved over 20 years of research. And uh, what he liked about the way I write about it, see, his products didn't sell because he really pushed the data. And what I decided to do in my thinking about weather history was to tell a story about how people were affected by these weather events and then embed the data with it. So I can tell you how much snow fell in a certain period of time, what the winter, winter ended up doing, what happened with the railroads, you know, the derailments, and, or even like the city of San Francisco streamliner train getting trapped. Right. These are stories, just like the Donner Party. You know, all of them are related to the weather. And that's once we decided to move here, uh, put a railroad through, put a road through, and then live here, it set us up to be battling the Storm King every year. Right, and we'll be talking about that in a couple of moments. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, forgive me for this question, but I'm kind of curious, and I think people at home might mm -hmm. also be curious. How does one earn one's living as a weather historian? Uh, who, who, com who comes to you for your services? Uh, well, that's an interesting question, and it has changed over time. Uh, initially, there wasn't much money coming in. When I first started as a lark just to write these things, I wrote, I've already written the Nevada Weather Book, and the University of Nevada wants to publish it. Of course, the manuscript's 500 pages long, and they said, we love it, we just want more in it, but shorter. And I said, all editors want more in it, but shorter. Pictures. Uh, yeah, pic <laughs> well, pictures will work. Uh, but the thing is... Um, Oh, it's like I've done some consulting for, as we mentioned before, attorneys who are looking back for a particular event that occurred in a winter situation. What were really the weather conditions at the time? How much snow was really there? Could have been an accident occurred because of this particular situation? Or is the data or the accuser wrong because of what they're saying? Uh, I write, I have, um, besides my local weather columns, I write for the Nevada Magazine. I write for WeatherWise mag Magazine, Sierra Heritage. I have a pretty good uh, portfolio of magazine and work. And you lecture quite a bit also. I give well over 100 lectures every summer. Uh, people that come elder hostel program, these are people that are 55 and older. They come from out of town to learn uh, college level natural history courses. And uh, the last couple of years, I mean, we have on this little transcript that I'm interested in the Stevens party, but that's just all part of the Donner, the Bidwell Bartleson Stevens opened the California Trail uh, thing. But this year I did a lot of work on the history of gambling in Nevada, uh, right. Frank Sinatra, no, no, the Frank Sinatra, Frank era Sinatra Cal Neva, the Cal Neva. I did a whole series on the divorce and uh, quick divorce, quick marriage era. Uh -huh. See, my thing about Nevada is, and I think it's really pretty funny, is the fact that besides mining, the basic underpinnings to its economics are quick and easy divorce, gambling, prostitution, and prize fighting. And it's not your dis typical Disneyland family experience. So you had to carve out your own niche as a weather historian. Yes, and <laughs> I do whatever I feel like doing, actually. And the book sales have been very good, and that's been very helpful. And, uh, you know, it's just a matter in the way our society is today, especially generating product. You know, there's some of its intelligence product or, or, you know, just information product, but other parts of it are creating items and commodities that I feel that I can write and stand by and sell them.
Okay. Now, one thing I'd like to do while we have a moment is let's see if we can't uh, look back at some of the other La Nina years, getting back to the weather, oh. because your data collection on that, the history of it, is very important to what we mm -hmm. do today. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe we could start with, I, I understand you brought some photographs and things for us to look at the wettest mm -hmm. and then the driest years, and maybe that'll give us some idea of what to expect, perhaps. Sure, let's take a look. Okay. Let's, what are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at the, uh, the flood cleanup of, from the 1955 flood. Uh, you know, we talk about, I mean, we just had the January 1997 flood a couple of years ago. It was supposed to be epic. They finally gave it a 50-year cycle of return. And in reality, the floods are occurring more and more frequently because of encroachment on river systems, uh, overpopulation in the sense that uh, more and more quick surface runoff as far as the way the water floods into a river. So this is this photograph we're looking at right From here. From 1907. Oh, this is 1907. And that was a La Nina winter that gave us 884 inches of snow. It's still the Sierra's all-time record. Wow. And, and a La Nina, and then heavy snow and with very high water content, and then fluctuating snow levels brought a lot of water in in the spring, and it created the worst flood in western Nevada history. Now that is a photograph of the Truckee River in Reno? Yes, that is the Virginia Street Bridge. It is the only bridge out of that, out of the three main rivers uh, draining the eastern Sierra in northern Nevada, which are the Truckee, Carson, and Walker Rivers, Every single bridge on all three of those rivers was destroyed except for that one bridge. Now, it's the only one that stayed. So a lot of our problems uh, have to do with containment of the river. What did the river yes. do before Reno was there? It would just flood out in the springtime, <clears throat> just like the Mississippi does. Well, now we have the Mississippi's five stories high going past. <laughs> and it needs some elbow room. And the thing about, and this is something that's very common in La Nina winters, is flood events early. They tend to come in hard, they come in wet, and they tend to fizzle out after the New Year's. That's why last year was so great. It came in hard, it gave us a big, good start. Christmas was dry and sunny, the tourists were here, people were having a great time skiing. Then nothing started to happen for the first three weeks of January, and all of a sudden everybody's hitting the panic button. Here we are, and then, but then, the storm door opened again. February was very snowy, March turned out to be snowy, and it was unusual in that sense that the La Ninas tend to come in hard and heavy and then tend to dissipate. And that is one of the reasons why it creates floods. It comes in when we don't have much of a snowpack. It's been cold. As I mentioned, the temperatures get cold. The ground gets frozen. Subtropical rains come in. They wash directly off the mountains and right off the watershed and into the rivers. Interesting. Yeah. Well, one, now do you have some more photographs to show uh, anything? Um, I forget what the next one was that we had. Well, we can talk a little bit about this one. This is really a drought from uh, the late 70s and into the early 80s. You know, many people are already mm -hmm. forgetting that we had a very serious drought in the 80s. And uh, this is before snowmaking. This is actually at Alpine Meadows. I'm sure uh, now, they'll for, say this me is... for one moment. Go ahead. Droughts are also very normal in this region. That's exactly so that's, right. Now, that's an interesting point that I wanted to bring up, and that is that uh, we get up in arms when we have a drought, we get up in arms when we have floods like we did in uh, January of 97. Yet these are very normal occurrences. In fact, the winter of 1862, 1861. 61, 62. was a tremendous flood in the Central Valley of California. Yes, uh, heavy rains, high snow levels uh, in late December of 61, and then throughout the first half of January uh, brought down tremendous amounts of water into the Central Valley. And as you mentioned earlier, it was a lake nearly 280 miles in length and maybe 30 or 40 miles across and actually uh, washed the, the state legislator out of uh, Sacramento and forced them to San Francisco for six weeks so the water came back down. But then what did they start to do is put install the levee systems and little by little start to control the American and Sacramento rivers. You know, the American river is rated the most dangerous river in the United States. On what basis? Uh, the flood frequency. It's very short and there's a minimal amount of control. There's a couple upstream water uh, dams and reservoirs, but the way that the river actually works, and there's so many people on it, it has the potential to be a very serious flood situation there. Interesting. Why don't we uh, take a break for just a couple of minutes, and then we'll uh, look at some more photographs of some more uh, snow occurrences and heavy weather and drought years and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the avalanche at Alpine in 1982 or 3? 82, good. Okay, we'll do yes, that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Truckee Talks. I'm Ted Owens here with uh, Mark McLaughlin talking about weather history. And I believe we were going to get back into some of the photographs of uh, some of the uh, more recent uh, debacles that we've seen up here in the Sierra Nevada. So why don't we pull those up on the monitor? Let's do it. We've had some great weather the last 30 years. Now this is, a, this, is a, this is one actually that I've seen in a number of books and down at the Nyack uh, uh, tow station down there. This was uh, down near there, wasn't this? Well, this was uh, just west of Yuba Pass, so it's definitely west of Donner Summit. But yes, this was in, uh, in January of 1951, uh, excuse me, 1952. Uh, the city of San Francisco, a luxury streamliner train, actually most modern train in the United States at the time, uh, was trying to get through the Sierra during an extremely intense blizzard, 100 mile an hour winds, uh, drifts, uh, reportedly reached 50 feet. The old highway, Highway 40, which Interstate 80 has replaced, was closed for 30 days. And that's why you can see these gentlemen, this, they were all heading to the Korean War. This is, they were all being shipped out to Oakland to go off to the Korean War in 52. So these guys here, what they did, they bulldozed a section of 40, opened it up for one-way traffic, backed up the vehicles, unloaded everybody from the train, got them into the cars and then took them down to Sacramento where they got them back into the railroad and then finally got them off to Oakland so they could ship out. Now, how long of a process was that? How long did that Well, the train was there for, uh, the storm lasted for three days. The train was broken out on the fourth day, the morning of the fourth day. And uh, there were some problems. It wasn't so much, even though it was funny because uh, the local papers were talking about how here's a train with 226 passengers and crew trapped in the Sierra, running out of food. And then, of course, there's always the referral to the Donner Party as the aside. <laughs> Uh, but, th you know, there were a couple of different little outfits that got in there and rescued them. But what happened was uh, a bunch of people got sick from backed up uh, uh, combustion fuels from the heating systems and such. But two men did die. One man was uh, Roland, Ra Raymond Roland, who was trying to bring in a rotary snowplow. Uh, he got very close to the train and he disengaged. He got out to look and at that moment an avalanche came down, destroyed the machine and killed him, unfortunately. And then another man, I believe, uh, Jay Gold, who was in his mid-30s and died of a heart attack. Uh, so all passengers and crew were rescued su successfully. Uh, two men gave their lives, though, in that attempt. Um, it was really quite, it was national the, news. It was a big deal. The, the railroad and their snow sheds and what have you, there were a lot of redesign issues following that uh, event. Were, were not, not that I know of. This had nothing to do with sheds. Uh, no, no, but uh, oh. to try to handle the snow issue with respect to the railroads. Well, you know, that story, and this is, I have to make a quick aside to this. Basically, the way I see the railroads, the shed situation is Theodore Judah, the engineer who blazed the trail, he went back east. He looked at the way they managed snow in the Allegheny Mountains, in the snow belt there, said we shouldn't have a problem. The plows will put the snow over the side. He makes the railroad come up through the summit area, and uh, what happens is he dies, of course.